Today, I'm so happy to welcome back my friend and special recurring guest, Barbara Carnes. And in case you don't know Barbara, which, which almost everyone should know Barbara by now, Barbara is a hospice nurse, an international speaker and educator, and an expert on end-of-life issues. She's the author of the Little Blue Hospice book called Gone From My Sight, which many of us have seen if we work in a hospice anywhere. And her newest book is by your side a guide for caring for the dying at home which is a fantastic resource that everyone should have at home and you can learn more about barbara's books but also watch her videos and see all the other resources she has on her website bkbooks.com so barbara welcome back again it's so good to see you it's always great to be here i really appreciate our conversations me too. I look forward to it, you know, for days and days when I know it, we have something scheduled. And so today we chose the topic of how to care for loved ones with dementia at the end of life. And it's such an important topic because I was looking up statistics and they estimate that currently there are 7 million dementia patients in the U.S. receiving care and 80% of them are being cared for at home by family caregivers. And also that the care requires twice as much time as the care for any other patient uh, at home at the end of life. And so when it's just staggering to think of the number of people providing care to a loved one with dementia, probably feeling overwhelmed and um, having very few resources to turn to. And I know you talk a bit about this in your book. So I just wanted to talk about it a little bit today. Um, what One thing is that dementia patients are very different in the last stage of life, which can last one or two years than say a cancer patient might be. And to talk about some of the differences, you know, the fact that a dementia patient can't walk at all or talk usually at the end of life and how that increases the stress of the care we're trying to provide. Well, you know, dementia doesn't play by the end of life rules. Um, it isn't until eating becomes, uh, swallowing becomes a challenge. So they can be asleep all the time for years they can be withdrawn and not interacting um, or be otherworldly for years and the toll that that takes on that the caregiver takes on can literally become overwhelming and we can lose our caregivers before we lose our patients if we don't really recognize as a healthcare profession how to support and give help to the caregivers. And our healthcare system right now is not set up to give any relief or really any help to the caregiver at home. It's so true. And I think. One thing for caregivers caring for a loved one with a, a different type of chronic illness or life limiting illness, oftentimes they're still able to have a relationship and there's a back and forth exchange and there's gratitude expressed and love being shared. And many times, not to say that a dementia patient is not aware of the care they're receiving, but it's just their ability to communicate, to say thank you, or I love you, or to, e to even have the same type of close relationship that was held before is very limited. And so the caregiver doesn't get very much back sometimes in this relationship of caregiving. And I think that also makes it really challenging. Well, and I, because dementia evolves, uh, literally evolves, it starts with, you know, a few forgetfulness and then it involves in a whole all different kinds of ways for the caregiver who has been with this person when they were healthy 
and mentally fine, it's hard for the caregiver to deal with or even acknowledge the changes that are occurring. And so early on in the disease, there's an added frustration that the caregiver has. It's like, of course you remember when we did such and such. And no, they may not. And it takes that caregiver a time to readjust their relationship with the person that has dementia. And that readjustment adjustment goes from normal, and I put that in quotes, to generally total care of a stranger, of someone we don't recognize anymore. And someone that may not recognize us anymore, that does does not know who we are. And I think one of the challenges is this late stage dementia can last a couple of years at least. And hospice, as, as we've talked about before, is really designed to occur at the last six months of life. So it means by the time hospice comes in, the caregiver will already have spent a great deal of time caring for their loved one without support from hospice. Then even when hospice does come in, what hospice is able to offer doesn't come close to meeting the needs the caregiver might have at that point. Well, our medical system is not set up to provide custodial care in the home. Um, most people can't afford to hire someone 24 seven, even 12 hours a day. Most of us can't afford that. And so there's this void in our healthcare system to give support to these patients and the caregiver Hospice has come forward and they're, it's like they're trying to fill the void, but they, with their regulations and their protocols, they really can't fill that void. And there's no one else in our healthcare system that's stepping up and saying, here's what we need and we'll give it to you. Because I think hospice definitely can help with some with symptom management, pain and symptom management, can send in a home health aide to help with some of the hygiene, but that might only be a couple of days a week. And, um, and that's something definitely, definitely something that's helpful, maybe a volunteer, also a chaplain, you know, to give support and bereavement support to the, the caregiver. But um, still, the needs in that situation are just overwhelming. Oh, absolutely. And we're, we're dealing with, in hospice, the guidelines are really six months when this support and help is needed for years. And they, the idea of home health which could give some help is that we're going to get you better. And so um, there isn't any part of our healthcare system that says we recognize you're going to have, you're going to go downhill for years. And that's so tricky because of that six month criteria in hospice. I think some doctors, it's very kind of difficult to tell with a patient with dementia where they are in that course of progression. And so some doctors may wait until the very end when they see, oh, now this person has pneumonia or you know an overwhelming infection, they're definitely going to die now before they would even refer to hospice because they just don't know for sure. It's hard to identify where the patient is on that continuum. Well, and what I use as guidelines and, and recommend is that when the person can't swallow, you know, you know that if they're not taking in adequate nutrition, that they will die and they will die well within the six months. Um, but 
that's hard too because we are so we have so much emotion that evolves around food that it's hard for the medical um community to say well let's not do a feeding tube you know that's where our medical model takes us when in reality when that choking occurs it's really in everyone's best interest to let the natural dying process begin exactly nature is is providing a process it's providing kind of a way out of this terrible disease in a way if we allow nature to take its course and allow natural dying and it's true the medical system may come in and and provide pressure um, to do a feeding tube which only prolongs the suffering and prolongs the the dying process for the patient well and i i think it's important that the national alzheimer's association they have given an opinion on not having feeding tubes, uh, which I, I am impressed with, um, that they have that support of knowledge that almost gives official, and I put that in quotes, permission to not have the feeding tube. And I think it's really important for everyone to think about this, but in the early stages of dementia, the patient is still capable of making decisions for their own well-being at the end of life. And I think it's important to be able to have an honest conversation about what is coming down the road and to ask the patient at that point for their guidance and what what they would like and how they would like to be treated because particularly if they feel strongly don't keep me here longer than my natural not the natural process of dying would allow for if you put that in writing and make sure it's in an advanced directive then you do have something to use to say no to a feeding tube well and I think having that advanced directive and having the talk with with the primary care physician before any of that becomes evident, then it's not an emotional entanglement. This is intellectually, this is what I want. And you have that with the, with the physician really before you need it. Now, I know I said before you need it because you really need it before you need it, if that makes any sense. It does make sense. And it, it makes sense to me that it helps in some ways with the grieving process, I think, for the caregiver in a way, because the decision in a sense has been made in advance. It's not all going to fall on the caregiver who, you know, at, at the time when they're asked, do you want a feeding tube for your loved one or not? Part of them might be saying, no, I'm ready for my loved one to die. I'm exhausted. I can't do this anymore. And then there may be a reaction of guilt to feeling that way or thinking those thoughts, which might push them in the other direction to agree, fine, yes, go ahead and put a feeding tube in out, out of guilt. And no one should have to feel guilt ever for, for the care they provided and for the fact that they're just tired and they, they've been through uh, and massive ordeal for years well and i talk about how caregivers um need to put their oxygen mask on first and yet most people who find themselves in a caregiving situation are the a personality that's a giver a doer a fix it i'm here for you and so with that um, they can literally put themselves last. And then that's when we burn out our caregivers. And that kind of personality in making the decision to let a natural death unfold, as you pointed out, 
that personality is going to take on the guilt of, oh, I'm tired. And it's, if I weren't so tired, I would be able to continue to do this. And um, it really isn't about the caregiver and the and what's happening in the disease, but the caregiver is the one that takes on all the work, all of the emotional entanglements, and then the guilt. And, and not only has our healthcare system not done enough to offer support to caregivers, but I really feel like there's a breakdown in a lot of communities as well that we just don't have the support we could use for people in their neighborhoods, in the, the groups they belong to, and even in families now oftentimes are separated and live far apart. And so a caregiver literally could feel alone without, without anyone around to call upon for help. Well, there is a movement out now for dementia doulas, and there's training for dementia doulas, and this would be, it's not going to answer everything, but it makes it so the caregiver is not alone, um, that there's someone who can guide them on a regular basis, a pick up on the phone and say, I don't know what's happening, or I'm so tired, I have to go to bed now. Someone that is a support. And I hope that that becomes um, really well known among the dementia community. Let's also bring it into churches so that churches can recommend uh, and give assistance churches can give volunteers, you know, to set up days where they can, different people can come in. As you pointed out, we have to use our community resources. Um, I love the idea of dementia doulas because they could get involved right at the beginning, early in the dementia diagnosis, unlike hospice, which can't come in until the very end when it's already too late sometimes to help set things up and put things in place. And a dementia doula could have could know about lots of community resources that the caregiver may be unaware of and could really help the caregiver set things up in the very beginning to have a better pathway and trajectory through this whole long process. And be there for the whole time. Now, they're not going to be a 12-hour shift, but they are going to be as close as the phone and saying, um, help, you know, uh, that, that reassurance that I'm not totally alone for the caregiver is what will keep the caregiver giving care. That's so true because, you know, you can imagine the times of loneliness and even fear and desperation and not knowing what to do next, but having that phone number and knowing who to call and where, where to get some answers and just to get some support can make all the difference. Well, and, you know, the on that phone call to pick up and say, oh, my God, you wouldn't believe what just happened. It's just that sharing with someone who will believe and who will understand and can then give you the support so that when you hang up, you can go back to doing your caregiving. And as you pointed out, because many, many caregivers are doers who are used to taking care of others, we also need to teach caregivers how to ask for help and to ask for it early on, not to wait until there's a crisis and everything has fallen apart. Well, and to take care of themselves, you know, that's so key because most caregivers don't, you know, all the attention goes on to the person and the caregivers just in the background really making everything come together and work but they're kind of 
lost in the shuffle. And that um, is a really recipe for the caregiver to burn out and say, I can't do this anymore. Um, it's the caregiver takes on such a huge responsibility without what I would like to see adequate support in doing that. It's so true. And maybe it just occurred to me, like maybe the caregiver needs to have their own regular appointments with the physician without the patient being present. So the caregiver can talk openly and just be asked questions about how are you doing and what, and what do, do you need? Because I think I could imagine many caregivers don't want to ad admit that they're struggling. They, you know, they, they feel that they don't have a right to complain and they shouldn't say anything. And if they're taking their loved one in for a medical appointment, they won't talk about themselves unless time is set aside with them being specifically asked, are you okay? And what do you need? Well, and, you know, early on, my first thought was, well, the caregiver needs a support group, someone that, you know, you go and you sit with other caregivers and you support each other. But the problem with that is how does that caregiver get out of the house to go to a group? And the, de the dementia doulas can be the ones that come in and stay with the patient while the caregiver goes to that support group um, because the isolation that goes with the caregiver um, is, is absolutely overwhelming. And one of, I think one of the big reasons for burnout is the isolation and the lack of feeling support. So true. And if every caregiver knew how many more caregivers there actually are in their own community who are hidden in, in many ways, um, they would not feel so alone just knowing other people are also doing this and are also struggling with it as I am. Well, and as, as you're talking, I'm thinking a church group could have a dementia support group and have church members that would volunteer to go in and patient sit while the caregiver is in the support group. And all of that comes from the hub of the church community. That would address both problems and give help. That's so true. And we could possibly even do things in a like a neighborhood community in a way as well. Um, as having a, you know, a, a neighborhood people who live nearby coming together in a way to decide we want to support one another. But I, I really wanted to also think about the fact that there could be a time when it just is not possible to keep a patient at home. And that I think it's good for caregivers to be aware of that and to have already thought that through what might happen if I simply can't do it and I can no longer take care of my loved one at home alone. Huge, huge. And finances becomes the big thing, I think. You know, um, in order to get into a nursing facility under Medicaid, there is certain amount of money that your resources have to go down to. Well, then what happens to the caregiver when death comes? And so um, regular Medicare, to my knowledge, is not paying for nursing facility care. So when that time comes, what do you do? Yeah, it's, it can be such a desperate situation. I was reading an article actually by a financial planner who wrote that he talks to his clients when they're young about all of these issues and says there might be a day when, when you, one of you needs to be in a long-term care facility and you need to start now planning ahead and setting money aside and thinking about what would you do and how would you get the help you need. I was blown away to hear that. And it actually sounded like 
that may be the perfect person at that stage of life to have this conversation, which medical providers are not having this kind of conversation with younger people, but maybe the financial advisor is the right person who can say, prepare and set aside money and have, have your backup plan for how will you cover these expenses. Yeah, it, it's a huge obstacle in, again, in our healthcare system, um, that there will come a point, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, there will come a point where there is no one to take care of them in their dementia process. And what happens? Mm -hmm. What happens? And, and what happens, we know that a lot of caregivers become ill themselves in the process of trying to care for a loved one who takes care of them. You, you know, it's such, it's such a crisis when you think of it in those terms. And if al already we're lacking caregivers for the dementia patients, if we lose the family members that we have who are already the ones willing to give that kind of care, we're really in significant trouble. So I think at this point, because we, our system doesn't offer us enough solutions to the problem, each of us has to be proactive in a way and look at our own communities and almost have our own game plan. What will I do and how will, what, what options might I have in the future? I would hope that discharge planners, that social workers that are connected to hospitals would be able to guide and find support and answers. Um, you know, we, we love our Google, but it's better if you can have a community resource within the community that you're in. And I think the hospital, um, staff, social worker, discharge planner um, can help and that we can ask for that help. And we should be. And I think, I honestly think we should be kind of demanding help in some ways from, from these people to make them make sure they're aware and make sure they're thinking all the time about these needs. And even making it publicly known that we need much more support for caregivers in every community and put it on people's minds so that they're thinking about it and thinking of how, how to come up with solutions. Well, and you know, most of us are ostriches and bury our head in the sand that that's not going to happen to me. It's other people, but the, amount of dementia diagnosis in this country is building and building. And we definitely need everyone to take that possibility into consideration. And what would I do if? Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but what would I do if? Yes, yes, exactly. And I know I, I was thinking like for caregivers right now, like what's out there, what's available to a caregiver. And I know there are videos on YouTube that teach a lot of skills that caregivers might need because that's another thing. The people providing care have never been taught actually how to do some of the things that they have to do, even to administer medications. How do you get a patient who's argumentative or combative, combative to take their medication? How do you give a bed bath? How do you, you know, people have not never had any training in these skills. And I know there are YouTube videos people can watch to get some of that training. Um, but I, I, are you aware of any other resources that could be helpful? Actually, unfortunately, no, I'm not. And that's part of this huge, sad dilemma that we find ourselves in. Um, as I said, Google's our best friend. You can Google how to give a bed bath and it will tell you how to give a bed bath, but it won't tell you the thing that, it will not be able to answer the questions that you don't know to ask. And I think that is 
as you pointed out, that's where our caregivers, so many of our caregivers are. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what to ask. They're just using one foot in front of the other. Uh, and it, it could be so much easier if they were given instructions and what to expect. And that's interesting because we've talked before about the comparisons between um, having a, a brand new baby at home and caring for, you know, uh, a loved one at the very end of life, the beginning and the end of life. And I was thinking of parenting in the very beginning is so similar. Parents have very little training, don't know what they're doing, don't know what they don't know, don't know what to ask. But I see tons of information out there right now, all kinds of articles being written, blog posts, and all kinds of supportive information to help parents get through it. And then also all, all of their loved ones who've raised children that they can go to and ask. And we really do need more information like this for people working with loved ones at the end of life. And I think we need more of the wise elders to step up in a way, you know, to say, to make themselves known, even within their family group, like, I took care of aunt so-and-so, you know, 10 years ago. And if you need any help, I have a lot of ideas. I can tell you what I did or how it worked for me. I, I think we need to be offering each other that information. We, we definitely do. And um, families are so scattered these days they're they're all over the country and you, you as a caregiver and your loved one can be isolated and stranded from all that support group of a family because no one else is in town with you and that presents a problem but one little thing that is i think extremely helpful is either zoom or telephone and check in with your caregiver and your house dad doing today. Is there anything you need? Uh, what's happening? So that even if you're not in the same town, you can still be as close as the phone. And your caregiver is not going to have the energy to reach out. So we who are the support family or the support neighbors, or whoever it is that we're supporting, I use that word a lot, um, whoever that is, it's up to us to reach out to the caregiver because the caregiver won't reach out and tell you, I need help, not gonna do it. And I was wondering, Barbara, do you think there's a stigma in our society still around dementia and if in some families it feels embarrassing or shameful that their loved one has dementia because partly they don't understand it they don't understand this disease or what causes it and that um do you think it's sometimes hard to help to ask for help because some people feel that stigma and feel like they they need to keep their circumstances hidden from others Wow, that's a really good question that I haven't really thought about. Um, there are some personalities that keep their life very close to themselves and don't share and don't ask for help. And then there are other personalities that are very outgoing and outspoken and will complain. So look at the personality of the caregiver. And if it's a quiet, I just keep plugging along, I keep doing, then you need to know that you're, you're the one that has to take the steps of offering help. And as I say that, really, that applies to all of us in all the situation with caregivers. Don't wait until they ask for help. If they ask for help, then they're really drowning. And so we, the, the core group, need to 
make the first move, say the first thing uh, to support that caregiver. And, and one thing that I would like to normalize is setting up help in advance. Like when you have a loved one who's initially diagnosed with dementia, even though the caregiving may not be as stressful as that at that point, to be able to call together family members, friends, community members and say, I am going to need help. I don't need you as much today or right now, but down the road, I'm going to need help. And I need you to be aware of that. Um, I, I can't provide this care all alone. Um, I, I, I will have to call on you and I will call you and I will tell you, I need you. I need you to come. I need you to help me out. I think it would be great if we could prepare in advance in that way um, and, and help caregivers be empowered to prepare in that way. Oh, and, and to get it across to the caregivers, that's not a sign of weakness, that, yes. that it's, it is what is normally going to happen. You can't do this job alone. It has nothing to do with your inability or your weaknesses. This is how it is. This is hard work. And you need support in doing that hard work. And what if, if you're, if the medical provider who made the diagnosis of dementia had a visit where, where they talked about, okay, who's your care team? Who's your emergency care team? Who will you be able to call upon? Let's think this through. You need to make some phone calls right now. You need to bring people into your life and bring them on board and um, engage them early on. And, and let them know what you need. I don't think anything like that happens now at all. I don't think it does either. And in a perfect world, how wonderful and healing it would be when that diagnosis is given in the doctor's office. That, and because there's so much of this, that in the doctor's office is a social worker. And just absolutely par for the course. If I'm going to, as a physician, give a diagnosis, then I say to the family, now we're going to set up an appointment with our social worker, Jane, and she's going to talk to you and give you guidance of thing of what the next years are going to be. It would be, and you know, let's let Medicare or someone pay for that visit. Uh, in the office and right then out of the box you started support through education and planting seeds of what the next few years are going to be and really that should be the responsibility of the healthcare provider it should be that should be part of care right up front to ensure that the caregiver has the resources and tools that they need to provide the, the care at home that, that their loved one is going to have to have. Well, and we've got discharge planners in the hospital, which could take on that role. I want to see that discharge planner, that social work support person in the physician's office. Yes. Well, it seems to me that the clinic could be um, also the home of a support group for caregivers, like, like a physicians of all of their patients, the physician's office could somehow organize this support group um, by bringing people together. Love it. Love, love. Absolutely. Because that becomes the focal point, not just of the physical care, but the emotional and mental care for not just the patient, but for the caregiver. And which my bias is, all of those types of care should never have been separated in the first place. It's all the same thing. It's all part of care. Care should always have this whole person, whole patient, whole family orientation, not just be split off like, well, I'm only here for your physical care. That's all I'll talk to you about. Um, 
that would that would be beautiful. Here we are fantasizing and imagining how we could make things better, but honestly, it it wouldn't take that much. The patient is already being seen in the clinic. There's already a diagnosis being given. It's a matter of having personnel in the clinic who are trained to go the next step with looking ahead at the future. You know, I I see the only stumbling stumbling block is reimbursement. You know, to who's going to pay for the social worker and the discharge planner? Uh, who's going, well, the social worker will leave the, lead the support group. Um, it would be an amazing healing operation. And that's healing, as you pointed out, the whole person. And our medical model tends to just address diseases that people have instead of people that happen to have diseases. And this would be a wonderful step forward. How are we going to make that happen? Oh, I don't know. We need, we need to get it out there and do some education. Well, it could be that it's a death doula that gets employed in the visit in the clinic or the physician's office. That could be a place of employment for a deaf doula who then steps in and helps individual families. I could see that working. And a dementia doula. Yeah, yeah. dementia doula. A dementia doula, which is, you know, years worth of support uh, where death doula kind of ties yeah. in. Yeah, I said the wrong, I said the wrong thing. I should, oh. yeah, dementia doula is what we were talking about. It'd be, it'd be just wonderful. Well, let's hope someone's listening to this and does something about it. See, I think that's the value. Sometimes these conversations are our way of planting seeds because it isn't that we know right now, I mean, that we are capable right now of solving this problem, but we have ideas <laughs> and we can uh, plant seeds out there and hope that somebody listens who says, well, I'd like to try that. I'd like to see how that might work in my community. Um, because it, it's, a, it's a big issue right now and it's only going to get worse because we know that um, there will be, even as baby boomers continue to age, there will be more dementia patients in the future. And as we live longer, and we are living longer, um, COVID set us back a little bit, but that, you know, we're, we're hopefully through that. And so people will live longer. Um, yeah, exactly. So we have to start somewhere. Where we are right now is we have millions of caregivers out there right now who need extra support. And if you're in a community, if if you know of resources for caregivers, maybe you can help spread the word. Maybe you can help make sure caregivers know what's available to them because many may not they may not even know that maybe there's meals on wheels available that could help out by bringing food in that alone could be something helpful maybe maybe there are other resources that people just have not had access to and maybe all you do is help publicize it and make sure people hear about the the benefits that are available in your own community well, and you mentioned earlier um, neighborhoods. You know, we, we've reached a point where we have our little community neighborhoods and right there can be a support for caregivers. It may just be a phone call in the morning and saying, hey, how are you doing today? How are you doing this morning? I'm gonna go to the store you know, do you need anything? What can I bring back for you? Or I've got some, a couple hours this afternoon. How about I come over and you take a nap? You know, for us as individuals to reach out to people that we know who are dealing with dementia, um, we can take on that first step because the caregivers, got too much on their agenda they're probably sure. not going to ask for help they can't organize it they can't ask they they can't even 
get together, think of the names of people they might ask. That's the thing when you're that exhausted and working that hard, you kind of lose your own creativity for problem solving. And it's hard to think through even what would I do next? Who would I ask? Where would I go? Absolutely. So it's up to us to be their support. And if you see or have someone in your neighborhood, in your life, uh, a friend, a colleague, whatever, know that you can do a wonderful, wonderful service for that family by giving some of your time. And Barbara, what about your book by your side? I mean, I know it's not addressed specifically to caregivers of dementia patients, but um, talk about what's in the book that any caregiver could could find helpful when they're at the bedside caring for their loved one? Well, you know, most of us are just have no idea what to do for someone who is really, really sick in our home. So this booklet first talks about end of life and the dying process and what to look for. So first you have to know what you're looking for. Then it says, here's what you do about what's happening. So it's education um, and then it's hands on, here's what you do. And then big, big chapter on how do you take care of yourself as a caregiver? Um, and we, you know, we've spent the last almost hour talking about the caregiver um, dilemma. And it's so important that I made a whole chapter on what you can do as a caregiver to take care of yourself. I also address the fact that because of the stress a caregiver is under, their memory gone. No, no memory. So I created a worksheet that you can use every single day. And it addresses things like what did he eat? Did he pee? How many times? Did he poop today? You know, did he get out of bed? Those things that we don't remember that are important medication you write down the medications and you mark it when you give it because it'll be oh did I remember to give him his morning pills so you take those daily workshop sheets with you to the doctor when you have a visit and then when the doctor says well how's his bowels you can look through there and go yeah he goes every other day you know or whatever and I think that that's so important because as a fair caregiver, we don't remember. It's so true. And not remembering creates so much additional stress because you spend your time trying to think, oh, how, oh, did I, as you said, did I give the medication or not? How many pills were in the bottle? Should I count the pills? What should I do? What would happen? What if I gave it and they are, or what if I gave it twice? What if, what if I miss it? What will happen then? And the stress of that uncertainty is awful and it wastes a lot of time and energy and so to sim simply having those worksheets and writing things down saves you all of that um, that hassle and that extra thinking process and that anguish yeah I mean, there's anguish in that we want to do a good job but we're really treading water because the job is so big and any kind of support and help, little things like a, a worksheet will take some of the pressure off. Yeah, definitely. And likewise with, you know, having a newborn, I mean, that's what I've seen my kids do have, um, well, they do it on their phone, but keep track of all the same things. How much how much did the baby eat? When did they poop? How much did they sleep? Same thing. It's all, it's the same basic information, but yeah. when you keep track of it, you feel more confident because, because you have a better sense of, of what's happening and how this person that you love so much is doing. 
Well, if you think about the similarities between birth and dying, birth and death, um, on this continuum of life, you know, babies start out having a drink of water and then it goes to milk and then it goes to soft foods and they gradually work their way up to a regular diet. Well, when we're leaving this world, we start off, we stop eating meats and then it's fruits and vegetables and it eventually goes down to soft, then liquids, then just water. And you can look at those comparisons between birth and death. And when you've got a new baby, it really helps when you've got support and you've got, you're not doing it alone. And that applies on the other end of the spectrum also, right. life's spectrum. That's so true. That's so true. Well, um, a couple of other thoughts that came to me just... Um, I saw a video of a woman with dementia who hasn't been verbal for a long time, but who was a ballerina in her, in her life. And they played music for her, a, a ballet that she had danced to in the past. And she heard the music and she began doing all the hand motions of her dance. And so there are little things that caregivers could discover the power of music sometimes to tap into their loved one's memory. And I also remember, I remember a woman telling me her husband had always loved golf and that when she needed some time alone um, or just for him to relax for a little bit, she put on, she had this old videotape of a golf tournament that took place 10 years ago. She puts that same well, it was a videotape back then. We don't have those anymore, but say a DVD. She puts that on and puts her and her husband sits in front of the TV and watches the same golf tournament that he's watched hundreds of times, but he doesn't remember that he's ever watched it before and he loves it. And she said he's so happy and so content that he gets to watch golf and she gets a little break and a little relaxation for herself. So I was just thinking of those are a couple of the smallest little tips, but little things that could give a caregiver a moment or two of rest or peace. A oh, beautiful story. I love that uh, because I think we get so caught up in the dysfunction of dementia that we don't think about how, what can we do this moment? You know, the uh, what can we do this moment to bring some joy? And it's really about each individual moment as we move through time. Dementia, in most cases, takes away our past and it takes away our future. And it forces us and caregivers to live in the moment. And for us caregivers, it's often hard to understand what our loves, loved one's moment is when it doesn't relate to our idea of normal living. And it takes a special patience with a C, not a T, um, to live in the moment. Mm -hmm but assess where your special person is in each moment and try to address that. Mm. That's so true. That's so beautiful. And I think that becomes part of the bottom line in a way of just where our mindset and one of the ways of finding peace maybe is being willing to just just be in this moment right now and not focus on what has been lost, what your loved one can't do anymore, uh, or fear of what the future holds, but what what happens right now. And um, maybe put on some music or a television program or share some ice cream or like something. Maybe there's a way to find just a, a little moment of joy in this present moment. And really, isn't that what life is about? Isn't that really what each of each one of us 
should be doing with life. And yet most of us live in the past or the future and we miss our present. Mm -hmm. um, it's a gift. So true. That's so, uh, that's such good wisdom just for all of us to, to listen to and to remember right now. Don't take your eyes off this present moment. Keep, keep yourself focused there no matter yes. what. Well, if you or I and I were in charge of something huge, we, we would fix a lot of problems. <laughs> I believe it. We have great ideas. <laughs> Love it. Yes. <laughs> Turn the world over to us. We'll, we'll. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's always, it's really fun to talk with you, Barbara. And I love tapping into your wisdom from all the care you've given over the years and, um, and just your, your insights and your way of looking at the world. It's really precious. You are a treasure and thank you so much for sharing what you know. <laughs> oh, goodness. Thank you. I look forward to you and I having our talks back and forth. So thank you for inviting me into your life. You're thank welcome. You. Me too. And I hope we planted some seeds and now we have to wait. It'll be two more months and we'll get to come back and talk together once again. Okay. Have a good two months. Yes, you too. <laughs>